All right. I think uh, we've got pretty well everyone uh, into the into the Zoom program. So welcome everyone to our first ICCE webinar. My name is John Bales. I'm president of ICCE, and I'd like to thank you for joining us. First of all, I hope you're all well as we face the challenge of life under COVID-19 and experiencing social distancing and stay at home orders. We thought it would be a good time to really keep people connected and to initiate a group of webinars. And this, this is our first one. So thanks a lot for joining us. It's great to see lots of familiar faces come up on the screen. Our topic for today is athlete-centered coaching. And this really grew out of discussions at the Nippon Sports Science University Coach Developer Academy last February. And so we brought together, I think, what will be a great panel to initiate discussion on this and provoke a lot of people's thinking on really the, the core, the foundation, philosophy and values within coaching. So let me start by introducing our panel members. We'll start off with Michelle De Heiden, who's National Elite Coach Manager of Gymnastics Australia. She's a former head coach of women's artistic gymnastics at the National Center of Excellence in Melbourne and a graduate of NCDA. Dr. Masa Ito is professor at Nippon Sports Science University, the founder of the NCDA, and runs the Center for Coaching Excellence at the university. Per Elias Kolfas is head of coach education for the Norwegian Ski Federation and is also a graduate of NCDA. Gerd Vanderbroek is a professor in the Faculty of Human Movement at KU Leuven University in Belgium and national coach of the Belgian women's volleyball team. And then we've got the ICCE support team, myself, Karen Livingston, um, really operating the technical aspects and Sergio Lara Berciel will be helping to facilitate the discussion. So let me turn it over to Sergio to give you some of the uh, logistics. Thanks, John. So hi, everyone, and welcome to the first ever ICC Connect webinar. Um, it's a great pleasure to, to be here with you today. Thank you for making the time, uh, as John mentioned, we sincerely hope everybody is, is well uh, and healthy. Um, both physically and mentally, which might be even more challenging sometimes in, in the current condition. Um, my job, as, as John mentioned, is to support you in, in getting the most out of the webinar, uh, moder moderating both the panelists, but also moderating you a little bit as well. So in that sense, if I can quickly run you through the family rules of, uh, of how we are going to try and interact today, that would be great. Uh, for the sake of improving the connection and also uh, allowing us to focus on the panelists, we would love to ask you to keep your camera and microphone off unless you are one of the panelists. That would really help. Um, we would also uh, like you to constantly, as much as you want, submit your questions using the chat function. So, so we can then look at them and, and, and I will make sure that I get to as many of those questions as possible with the panelists. Um, we want you also to, to understand that we're here. We're not here to agree with everything that everyone's going to say, um, but we need to constantly um, be respectful in, in understanding someone else's position. So please on the chat or, or in any way, just be respectful to each other and, and just remember that we're here to share uh, and learn together. And finally, please, 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 uh, as much as you want, uh, comment on social media, make people aware um, of, of the webinar or whatever caught your eye on the webinar. And, and let's have a, a great time together. Um, with, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the first panelist, 
um, Michelle, who is going to really set the scene um, for the rest of the webinar. Over to you, Michelle. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. I guess I'm going to kick things off by sharing um, with the group a wicked problem, as Liam would say, that I have been challenged with in gymnastics. Um, I currently work at the national team level with a, a group of coaches from mentors, um, national team coaches, developing coaches, and athletes transitioning into coaching. And um, this topic of athlete coaching is something that I looked at with um, the Adaptive Growth Challenge through the NCDA. And um, I guess I'm really keen to, to find out and get lots of information from this evening um, to help me. So in gymnastics, we, we kind of bandy around this term of athlete-centered coaching. Um, the Federation of International Gymnastics has um, athlete-centered as the underpinning philosophy. We present that at our FIG courses and the Gymnastics Australia um, coaching courses, um, which I helped design and, and develop, um, we use this term athlete-centered. Yet um, we don't really have a good understanding of what it means. And I guess the key questions I look at is, um, do I think this is because in gymnastics, it can be fun and exciting and enjoyable if you're a developing recreational type gymnast. But if you're a, an elite gymnast, it appears that the coaches think it's something completely different. Um, we applaud discipline. We applaud structure and, and obedience. And we, we say these are great things that we develop from our sport. Um, but on the other hand, we say we want athlete and we are developing athletes to think for themselves so my questions have been is this we completely don't understand what this means do we just talk about it and not do it um, so or is it just simply that the coaches all have different interpretations and and I guess this was something that I talked to Massa about is this something that is is the term the right term for us so if I look at gymnastics and I look at the elite space that I work within, I think the context very much drives the challenge. Um, it's an early specialised sport. Um, there's a very strong social power position from the coach. Um, the, the disempowering, I guess, behaviours that the coaches have are modelled. Um, the training hours, the intensity the really prescriptive uh, training regime and repetition is very strict. And we often are working with um, our elite national team athletes are 14 years old. Um, some of them are 25, but our, our developing ones are, are, are very young. And sometimes our coaches are working with athletes 10 years plus. So as the athletes grow and develop, potentially that the, the, the coach hasn't learnt to adapt or modulate what they do. Um, my role has been to work with the next generation of coaches and, and the challenge has been our culture is heavily influenced by the Eastern European and Russian and Chinese coaches. So they model it to say, do it this way. If you do it this way, you will be successful. And I guess the challenge for me has been to try and challenge this rhetoric and this behaviour without undermining the respect for our leaders in the sport. Um, how do I try and build a greater self-awareness with coach behaviour and the impact of the coaches, um, help them build a, a very strong coach-athlete partnership, but at the same time build an awareness of, of how they're going about it. So um, I guess that's the scene that, that I've set for myself um, to try and tackle. And, and like I said, um, having discussions like this and sharing information with other people is, is a significant way in which I can gain knowledge and we can all share from each other. Um, what I am gonna do is to pass over to Massa. Thanks, Michelle. 
Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Masa uh, from Japan, and I'm, as John introduced me, I'm the deputy director of the Coach Developer Academy at our university. And today, um, here, uh, it's very honored to be here to share our idea about the athlete centeredness. And um, I'd like to show um, the, a couple of slides to you guys. Um, yeah, uh, Karen, can I share the screen? Maybe you should um, stop the screen sharing your site. Yep. Okay, so I will. Okay. So uh, which one? Asa, just allow me to pop in yep. there for. Um, I should have mentioned before, the way this is going to run, each of the five panelists is going to have a five-minute intervention to set the scene from different perspectives, uh, and then we will go over to your questions, okay? So please keep popping the questions in the chat. Uh, I'm keeping an eye on the chat, and I will then relay your questions to the panelists once everybody has been through. Okay, thank you. Over to you, Masa. Okay, so uh, thank you. So I will uh, share the screen now. Oh, well, let me check. Yeah, okay. Um, oh, wait. Okay. Uh, sorry. Where's my share screen? Yeah, let's go. Okay. Can you see? Yeah. Uh, which screen are you seeing? Public opinion poll. Okay. Is this as a, a full screen? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. So um, to start, I want to share the, you know, the the kind of a, the very sad ac uh, incident in Japan. Um, we had a very sad incident a couple of years ago. The 17 years old high school boy, you know, killed himself because of corporal punishment. And actually the coaches there was trying to help him and try to, you know, you know, support him to be a better athlete. But actually what was, what happened was, you know, suicide case. And right after that, the newspaper company did a, you know, opinion poll and it said, you know, um, and they, they asked the, is corporal punishment acceptable? And the, about 40% of the Japanese people said no in any case. But, you know, surprisingly, about the 60% of the Japanese people said yes. You know, that was the, the situation we had at the time. And then um, they asked the, uh, the reasons as well. So, uh, you know, it's very interesting to see uh, here, you know, if, the many Japanese people thinks that if we have the kind of mutual trust with children or students, it's acceptable to use corporal punishment. And sometimes, you know, 40% said it's, it's, it's effective as educational guidance. What's surprising? And in the court, the guy's lawyer said, the coach's lawyer said, uh, corporal punishment was part of the feeling that he wanted to improve his player's performance both mentally and technically. And many people said, oh, they will understand when they got older. And then the wave of love coming from the mutual trust between me and my players. So that was the, the background of the Japanese culture. You know, uh, um, not everybody, but still we have these issues, you know, um, yeah. And then um, actually we, try, we want to, you know, in um, install or implement the applicant center coaching. And, but when we think about how our coaches were raised, actually they experienced coach center or just a couple punishment as well, so that they don't know how to coach in athlete center way. And we thought that we need to change the coach education system to um, learner center way. So, you know, before that, we are just delivering the lectures, but we're trying to change the, the way we um, teach or develop coaches in an active learning way for uh, giving the autonomy of learning to, to participants. So we are trying to be learner-centered coaching or learner-centered coach education development. 
And in order to do that, we need a better coach de developers who understand learner centeredness. And by doing this, in a, um, I will show you an email from a coach um, from our course. And I was leading this uh, program for JSPO, which is the uh, program provider for, for Japan for co um, coaching qualifications. So I, I'm going to just leave this and then could you read this uh, for a while? Yeah, and we've got a lot of emails from coaches who attended the program and then we are thinking maybe we are doing it the right way for now, but actually <laughs> we are struggling with the, uh, you know, um, some people who don't come to us. And that's the kind of a big, big cultural challenge, uh, the growth uh, challenge for us, adaptive challenge for us, you know, how to, ch how to change the attitude of the Japanese mind, not only in coaching, but maybe, you know, childcare, you know, um, raising the kids and so on in many places in the company there. So that's maybe we believe that we, if we can change the way we coach in sports and then uh, many people love coaching. So uh, at the sports, so I think the sports can lead the social change in the future. So that's the, the context. And then we, we try, what I'm trying to do is a challenge to, cha to change embedded culture. So that's the, my, my big challenge now. And then um, I'm gonna uh, pass the, the mic to you, Pierre. Yeah. Thanks, Masa. Thank you. Um, you can hear me, Sergio? Well, everyone, yes? Yeah, yep. Good. Um, I would like to also show some slides uh, about um, about Norway. Um, I just, maybe Karen should stop sharing the screen or should I just go on the top here? There, yes, thank you. Um, so, okay. <clears throat> um, So a little bit shortly about Norway. Um, as you know, we are a very long country, 5.3 million people, a really small country, um, but we have a really long winter in Norway from December to April. Um, we are in my federation where I work, which is the Norwegian Ski Federation. Um, we have about 1,100 clubs and 170,000 members. And we have an quite an amazing uh, record of medals in the Olympics. So uh, we, we kind of, I, I think we do, we do something right, at least in the top sport, uh, but it's maybe more interesting to see what we are doing behind. And when um, John asked me kind of what is the Norwegian philosophy? And from my point of view, as a kind of practitioner work, working in the field with, uh, with the coaches and also being coaching myself, I think we have a quite holistic view uh, on the athletes. And in that way, we have a kind of athlete-centered coaching system. Uh, our kind of highest goal is now uh, the quality in the everyday training. So we think that it, it's really important then to, to have a kind of a focus on the whole athlete, the, the whole life of the athlete to kind of be able to perform or to have the best effect in the daily training. Yeah. So our goal is then again to kind of develop some kind of self-reliant athletes. And even though we have a um, quite good system, I would say, uh, I think still we have a lot of um, uh, challenge with the coaches kind of to be able to 
to to get the uh, get the athletes to be self reliant they we are very depend a lot of athletes are very dependent still on the athletes and and we have to work on that and i think if we can see the fire in the eyes of the, the athletes the reflecting athletes the athletes who dare to go down in the learning pit and also that they feel that the, that this is their own project then we are having the best daily training and i've been working on a project where i tried to to kind of make a different approach to the athletes um in, in norway I, i will often say that um if we do something kind of video analysis or do some analysis and collect some objective data about training or the competitions of the athletes the coach is processing the data before they are delivered to the athletes and i have in the last year tried to make a change of that in order to kind of be more athletes centered and to instead giving the objective data directly to the athletes and i think i've seen some really interesting situations uh, uh, coming up from that where the where the athletes take a very strong ownership of their own project and also have a much better conversation with the coach afterwards when they have this objective data themselves and uh, yeah and also they often also connect to another athlete with their information so this is something we work on to try to kind of change this way of coaching uh, from coaching uh, kind of increasing the knowledge or the competence of athletes to have a bit more kind of fair discussion between the athletes and the coaches and of course this is uh, on a quite high level coach uh, athletes so compared to michelle's young gymnasts we have maybe the age of 20 25 years old athletes so it's probably a quite different situation and we also try to bring the the, the athletes into the coaching role themselves also to be kind of more aware of the role that the coach their coach are having so here's an example of one of the best cross country athletes johannes who is coaching other uh, uh, athletes uh, close to his age and i think that also gives um, a really nice development of the athlete and uh, a kind of athlete centered approach of the coaching and in the end i would just like to say that um, as far as i can see it it's like it's an ongoing circle kind of with from the academia with the sports science the coaches and the athletes where we all kind of need to be kind of translators between everyone and by turning upside down sometimes that the athletes um coaches uh, other kids or other young athletes and that the coaches don't get get, get the information first I, i think we have a more dynamic and interesting uh, developing uh, culture so that's i would say the main points in what we are working in now so i think that was kind of my um my introduction to my team and um i have yeah i can take it uh, a bit more of it later if you like Thank you, Carol. Yes. So then I should probably give it uh, give it to Get. Okay, thank you. Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good night. <laughs> depending where you're from. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, I will share also a screen with you. Um, I'm not yet able. Can you make it possible, Karen? Yeah, okay, thank you very much. So Just one second. Yeah. John asked me what is my evolution as a coach and I think 
from the start, I was quite athlete centered. I'm a coach in performance sports, so the result outcome goals are important. I'm a coach in team sports, so team goals are important, but I always focused on individual development and try to create a kind of synergy between individual development and team result and team goals. So I think from the start, point of view goal setting, I was athlete centered. Um, I asked a lot of input from the athletes, which we call in this compass, in this coach circumplex, uh, circumplex the participative style right uh, above uh, autonomous support. So we invited input from the athletes. We promoted dialogues about their ambitions, about their individual goals. And we tried to translate those goals into expectations. I think we made a combination between autonomous support, inviting inputs and creating a kind of structure, a kind of performance profile. We translated those goals into uh, programs, training programs, and we asked a lot of commitments from the athletes. This was the process. And then the third stage in this process is managing this expectation. So the first stage is setting goals. The second stage is setting expectations. And then we have to manage those expectations. And we call this clarifying. You see there uh, in, the, in, the, in the part of structure, we have guiding and we have clarifying. To manage those expectations, we have to clarify. We have to monitor permanently our athletes. And I think if there is an evolution in my coaching style, I will became more often in the beginning years demanding, maybe also sometimes domineering. I tried to control this process. And when there was a kind of conflict with the athletes, instead of clarifying or instead of attuning and giving a rationale for why we are working this way, and instead of allowing those kind of negative effect, I became more controlling, which is on the left side of the compass. And I think if I made an evolution, this is the evolution that I get myself more on the right side of this compass and I kept me in the zone of clarifying, maybe sometimes also demanding, but certainly not domineering because this kind of domineering style has a negative effect on motivational outcomes. Um, we use this compass we translate this compass in coach behaviors and we use this compass in coach education in Belgium. And for me personally, I was one of the developers. We did scientific work to construct this compass. I think as a reflection tool, we try to integrate in our coach education. The second question of John was, can you be demanding and respectful at the same time? And also we did some research about that. I think coaches, I think at, at elite level, we are judged by performance. We, 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 we need to be effective. And I think coaches are often demanding. But there are coaches, and I think when I observe coaches, I see a lot of coaches who are able to manage conflicts without losing a good relation with their players. Coaches who can repair the conflict afterwards. And I think what is important in that is that when they have a conflict, it is a result of a demanding style, not of a domineering style. And the research we did is when we combine, I don't think we can label coaches on one style, but coaches have to master different styles. And the best coaches we observed in our study are those coaches who are able to combine a style of being demanding with a style of being autonomous supportive. If they, be, they have a style which is domineering, it is impossible to combine with autonomous support because it's, they can sometimes combine, but it's negative on motivational outcomes, on well-being of athletes. But we see that coaches who are experts in autonomous support, they can be demanding in certain periods. It's not always negative. What is important to say is that only 20 or 25% of the coaches we studied, were able to combine, to combine those behaviors. Most of them are not able to combine. And what is important in self-awareness is that coaches who are aware of their behaviors, they will, you will see that they are less demanding. They are demanding in the way that 
they raise the bar, but they, they don't shift into controlling styles. They maintain more in a clarifying or soft demanding style. And um, what did I learn in real life? I think I learned a lot that the more the pressure, the more the support uh, people need. Um, leading is servant leading. Servant leading is a commitment to growth to others and cleaning the past um, when working together, when having conflicts. I think those are my main lessons. I think coaches can be demanding, but they first need to learn how to be autonomous supportive. Thank you, Sergio. Thanks a million, Gerd. Uh, so if you don't mind, leave, leave your presentation on. Oh. Um, my, my job now is to, um, to both um, help the panelists discuss with each other the ideas, but also to introduce questions from the audience. Uh, to, to warm everybody up, and there's, there's a few questions on the, uh, on the chat, I wanted to kind of start with this last notion of the, uh, the combination of demanding and autonomy support. Um, and I wanted to ask uh, the other panelists uh, their views on these and, and how, how, they, how they've seen these in their own, in their own environment, really this idea of can uh, an athlete-centered coach do this, be autonomy supportive and demanding? Um, is there a, a particular combination that they seem work best in their environments? And um, what, what's everybody else's view? Um, for example, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to, uh, because I know uh, Michelle mentioned this at the beginning, that in, in her sport, there is a tendency to, to be quite controlling. Uh, and that's actually a, a, a characteristic that we value in athletes when they are disciplined and obedient. So Michelle, I'm gonna go over to you. Um, how does this um, combination of demand and autonomy support behaviors from the coach sit with you in the context that, you've, that you work and is this an option for, you, for your coaches? Um, look, I think it definitely is. Um, I was looking at some of the questions that were coming through and I think this, this compass that um, Garrett has put up, it, it helps clarify, like I work with um, an older generation of Russian and Chinese coaches and to have a compass like this to help explain to them their behaviors and to help them understand and to say, look, if you shift more to the right side, it's a simple way of, of helping them understand what their own behaviors are like. Um, providing that support yet being demanding is, is critical. Um, we have huge safety risks in the sport um, and sometimes we use that to justify, I think, the dominating behaviours. Um, but but I, I think this, this compass is a, is a fantastic way in which to explain how we can get the best and, and model the best behaviours for coaches, but get the best out of the athletes. Thanks, Michelle. Any of the other panellists want to comment on this, on this notion of, uh, of that kind of sweet spot of... Um, demand and autonomy support behavior? Can I, can I mention that? Uh, can I give the case uh, from Japan? And um, yeah, thanks for sharing this, you know, Gert. It's, it's quite um, exciting and, and quite useful, you know, a chart. And I'm supervising uh, graduate students and then who does a lot of uh, actual researches. And I put uh, one judo coach to a, uh, a high school and actually, that lady, uh, uh, you know, uh, ju young judo uh, coach, lady coach, she went to the 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 place in in you know in the high school. Actually, she wanted to be an autonomy supportive coach, but actually, the athletes and the, their parents asked her to control everything or push them to win. And that was, you know, kind of a big struggling. And then um, it happened in Japan sometimes, and maybe in other countries. And um, the athletes, if I, I, I don't know how to do that. I mean, but there are lots of coach, you know, uh, the the athletes and and you know, parents and others, they want more kind of a harsh, <laughs> you know, a coaching. And but the the coaches himself was trying to, you know, learn about the autonomy supportive behavior 
that was the kind of a struggle, struggles we had in the past. Yeah. Hmm. Thanks, Masa. There's a couple of questions really that have been posted on the chat that follow up into this area. Um, and there was a question uh, from, I think it was Chris or Scott, I'm not sure now, but the idea of, and I think this, this question goes both for Fair and, and Gerd in the sense of a, if we are encouraging athletes to take more control and to, for example, like Fair Elias was saying, to do their own um, analysis of data and present their conclusions to the coaches, um, will athletes be honest with themselves, uh, even if selection or deselection into a squad is at stake when they are doing this analysis? Um, Fair, uh, how is that working with you in Norway? Are athletes honest in their assessment? Yeah, uh, hard for me to say, but uh, I think it's a really interesting question. And uh, I would say to uh, get uh, compass uh, or say complex, it's, um, I can see my, it's really demanding to be a coach on the top level in Norway because um, the athletes kind of uh, are so in the individuals and would like to do different things that it's even hard to get them together on the same camps and uh, go home the different days, go, uh, yeah, and all that stuff. So it, of course, um, it's not, uh, <laughs> it's not top all the time, but I think what I was talking about was not maybe, it, it was more like a kind of what in the, the setting I have been looking at is more like a um, tactical uh, performance in, in front of a competition. And uh, it was a competi two competitions day a row. Uh, so the first day they got the um, analysis of, of the first competition uh, and they looked at it and we would like, we follow them to see if they do, did some changes in the tactical way of going uh, their uh, cross country competition the next day. And it was not like judging themselves. It's more, more like comparing to another athlete, why did you win so much time there and I didn't, um, that stuff. So I think they were kind of honest there, but if you ask me if they should say who is going to go to the next competition, uh, I don't think I will get the same answer. <laughs> uh, thanks, Bert. Gerd, any comments on that? On yeah. Um, first of all, I mentioned this tool as a reflection tool. And I think often, Personal emotions determine which style you are using. Sometimes you become demanding because you feel pressure. And, and I think this is a reflection tool to become aware of those dynamic shifts, dynamic pathways in your coach behavior. But uh, at a certain moment, um, Massa mentioned um, that the athletes ask for a more directive coach. Or sometimes there are situations who require more directiveness of a coach. Um, and we did also some studies about that. And we see that when, for example, the athletes think that this is a decision the coach has to make, this is the responsibility of a coach. And in that situations, the coach allows of, of uh, is giving participation. This is not perceived as autonomous supportive, this kind of participation, but is perceived as domineering because, for example, I give one example, um, if it's about a selection of a team, this is the decision a coach has to make. And if a coach delegates this kind of decision um, to players, um, players don't expect this and they don't perceive this as a kind of autonomous support, but in the opposite way, as a kind of control, as domineering or avoiding responsibility, sometimes also chaotic. So I agree that we have to adapt our coaching style to the followers expectations, to the expectations of the athletes and to adapt on the situation. And that's interesting, really. It sounds like we're all saying that there is a bit of a, what, what some people call the Goldilocks principle. It has to be just right. And that combination of what's just right changes for every athlete in every context and at every different moment. Um, and that, that's demanding on the coach. I mean, how do we get coaches to be so self-aware that they can adapt and be, I always call it, be like a chameleon, really, and change your spots, change your color, Constantly, how, how do we, how can we get coaches to, to be like that? Any takers? I think by reflecting 
on our behavior and becoming master of different styles. Like I said before, I don't believe that a coach can be labeled with one threat, one behavioral skill, because the coach has to, to use and to master different styles, adapting on the expectations of the athletes, the situation, and which is important, he, he must be able to control his emotions to adapt in an optimal way his coaching style to the needs of situation and athletes. Michelle, you were you were shaking yeah. your head there at some point. <laughs> yeah. um, I think one of the things I've been thinking about is is this continuum, and and I guess it's a it's a, I'm trying to look at the developing coaches I'm working with so that they can understand that this continuum is something that you do need to adapt to. Um, they may be coaching 10-year-olds who are highly disciplined but lead a, need a lot, of, a lot of structure. And in the same group, they may have a 16-year-old who is quite rebellious and wants a different type of coaching style, yet they're in the same training squad or the train, training group. So the challenge to the coach is they often want them all to be the same. And, and I guess some of the work that I've been doing with them is for them to understand how to adapt on a continuum, if you like, of um, guiding more autonomous, empowering behaviour with one athlete, yet at the same time providing a little bit more structure to the younger athletes that may need it. Um, but that's a huge skill. <laughs> and so... I guess it comes back to the challenge of how do I help them develop that? I fully agree, Serge, um, depending on age development. Uh, also, we see some difference in profile of a team coach and an individual coach where team coaches are often uh, more clarifying and also more demanding because we also see depending on which outcome we see in this compass, we see at the right side, the amount of need support and we see that the attuning style and the guiding style uh, brings them the most of need support but if we look at other outcomes like task cohesion or group dynamical outcomes we see that as a, a certain switch in the compass and the zone of clarifying becomes more and more important so this is once again a proof of we need to we need to master different kind of styles and we need to adapt on age of the athletes development of the athletes uh, on, on, on team athletes, individual athletes, and depending on outcome. I wanted just to point out there really uh, the, the results that Gerd and his colleagues uh, found in, in their studies. Um, they, they got to a similar point to where we got with our, our study of serial winning coaches a few years ago, where we, uh, we, we studied 17 um, multiple gold medal winners at the Olympics and the world champs. And they all pointed at the same, in the same direction, two things, the idea of uh, that leadership or, or, or your behavior is not a, a, a constant, as Michelle was saying, it's a continuum and you need to move along that continuum to see the athlete and the, uh, and the situation. Um, and even though you may have a set point that that's where you feel most comfortable, that comes natural to you, you have to, the, 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 these great coaches were able to move along the continuum to fit the athlete. And I, I'm saying that because I mean, if, if these guys could do this at the highest level of competition, okay, when they're fighting for gold medals at the Olympics, um, I think that's a strong message to get across to coaches working with younger people. That if at the elite level, we can be demanding and autonomy supportive at the same time, we should definitely be able to do that with developing athletes. Um, how, how does that, how, how, I mean, I know you mentioned this, how, how does that fit with the idea of changing your, do you need to change that coaching style as athletes develop and grow? Or are we all still part of the same continuum? Um, Maybe one comment I would have um, within this space is that, that in gymnastics, often the coach may coach a, um, a young athlete for eight to 10 years. And I'm, I'm sure it happens in other sports such as, as swimming and maybe track and field and so on. 
um, and maybe it's more like the individual sports are more like this. And the challenge for the coach is, is um, and I guess in my role, is building that awareness that they are making appropriate adaptations to what they're doing. So they may feel they're actually providing more autonomy and they're, they're providing less structure and giving the athletes more ownership. But is it, are they simply pretending to do that? And are they mm -hmm. actually truly doing that? Um, and I guess the example I can give, um, we had an athlete um, recently who went to an international competition and she'd been coached by the same coach for nearly 10 years. Yet the athlete was little equipped to be able to make autonomous decisions by herself. Um, she couldn't troubleshoot and problem solve. And she was 19. And, and to me, she had a great coach-athlete relationship with the coach she worked with, but that coach didn't happen to be at that competition. So her ability to problem solve and her skill set was really weak as, a, as, a, as an individual because she was so reliant on the coach making those decisions. So I think the athlete-coach relationship is critical, but part of that is being able to be aware and know that you're truly developing those skills in the, in the athlete. Yeah, and that is something that um, in the audience we've got um, Sophia Jawet, who has uh, done a lot of research in terms of the coach-athlete relationship. And Sophia was mentioning uh, on the chat that it is really important that we, we really invest in knowing our athletes that that's really going to give us a lot of information that we will need to then decide what that athlete needs at a particular time. But Sophia was also posing a question that I'm going to pose to you. Um, we talk about one way of being athlete-centered is to, to be honest with the athlete and, and to offer constructive criticism so they can progress. Uh, but how difficult that is for some athletes to take. So how do we, the question was, how do we make athletes love criticism how do we get them to buy into that any anybody i think by giving a good rationale why you're working i think if you are working if you a lot of dialogue which is an important factor is a lot of dialogue with your athletes when you're autonomous supported you build a kind of trusting relationship and trust is the fundament of everything else and when you have this kind of trusting relationship, uh, your athlete is perceiving you as fair. And then he, you have to make him understand why you give him co or her correction. And to make him or her understand this, you need to have dialogue. And when you see that they don't agree with your correction, often coaches are shifting towards an abandoning style, they have no dialogue anymore, they avoid any dialogue with the athletes, or they have a domineering style, they have one direction, monologue, no dialogue anymore. And I think we use this tool to have a permanent dialogue. We try to, when we set goals, we try to make some kind of structure, a performance profile of the athletes, and then we, we, we structurize a permanent dialogue with the athletes. And in this performance profile, you see the evaluation in blue of the coach and the evaluation in red of the athlete. And then you see when, when there is different opinion about certain uh, skills, about certain things, you, you, you can see on this profile because they monitor themselves and the coaches monitor them. So you create circumstances, you promote uh, dialogue, you, you, you create certain that you never avoid this kind of dialogue. I think nobody likes to be corrected this is very everybody likes more to have positive feedback but if correction is understood in a positive way as something that helps you then it is less harmful and this simple tool of performance profiling is stimulating a permanent dialogue between athlete and coach and avoids that correction is being perceived as uh, negative Thanks, Kurt. Per Elias, um, I saw you, you know, very energetically, you know, nodding your head when Gerd was talking. Yes, I, I think it's uh, it's it's really interesting points, and um, I don't know, it, it's quite um, 
this uh, difference uh, between autonomy and when you are going to be kind of demanding and still I feel that um, the athletes, uh, especially in technical, uh, like technical issues in the sport, they kind of have to be, have it uh, own the problem or own the challenge so much by themselves. And I can see from a sport I've been coaching before, ski jumping, you can see the athletes coming to the um, uh, end of the stopping uh, arena in the ski jumping hill and got a mic from the TV company and say, how was the jump? And they say, um, I have to speak to my coach first. And then I think some bell starts to ring because they should kind of have a feeling, I think, uh, after the jump, how was this? And But sometimes it seems like there's so they need to speak to the coach to, to feel how this uh, performance was before they kind of dare to say, or even they can feel it quite good themselves anymore because they have been coaching so directly the whole time. There's a story um, about um, Jessica Ennis uh, in the 2012 Olympics when she got the, uh, the gold in the uh, heptathlon. Um, in the lead up to the Olympics, um, she was struggling with the javelin. Um, and in the end, it came down to the fact that every time she took a back throw with the javelin, she was always looking straight away to her coach, to Tony Minicello, looking for what did I do, what did I do wrong? And, and in the end, the solution from Tony was not to tell her until she discovered what she was doing wrong by herself so she could fix it. Because every time he told her, she wouldn't fix it. Um, and that really changed the way she um, she performed. Um, let me, we're coming to the end, so I'm gonna change stack a little bit. Um, both Michelle and Massa talked a lot about the idea of culture and how we may all agree on, on, on the fact that being athlete-centered is, is the way to go and, and what that may look in different contexts with different people, but making that cultural change for example, in, in, in Japan sport, in Japanese sport, or Michelle, for you, where the coaches come from different cultures, where this was not an option, okay? Um, the question from Chris and from Sebastian was, how do we change the culture? Uh, is education enough, or how, how do we plan to change a culture? Masa, you go first? Yeah, you go first, Masa. <laughs> okay, that's the, uh, you know, um, you hit the kind of a jackpot, I mean, you know, that's the challenge I'm having and then, um, yeah, I'm feeling always, you know, somebody who comes to me is almost done. I mean, you know, that decision makes him or her to change, but actually what, <laughs> what we need to do is to change other people who don't want to come to us. So, um, yeah, and then, but uh, I think my strategy is one of the, my strategies are using the qualification system to experience something. I mean, you know, um, in terms of the, you know, different types of the approaches, we use the tell, sell, ask, delegate approaches and then do a micro coaching in a workshop then, but it's most of the case, of course, the, a lot of people love telling and then, but we just value their coaching so make them feel safe psychologically to reflect on themselves otherwise as the guard said if you don't reflect your, yourself honestly you can't change your behavior afterwards so um, um as a coach developer what we're trying to do is to 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 make a kind of a comfortable not comfortable but you know it's the challenging atmosphere in the room. So that's the maybe, you know, trying to use the qualification system to invite people to learn something new. And then in that um, environment, they need to feel safe to challenge new things. Yes, that, that's the kind of a strategy we are trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Martha. And, and, and I guess building on what Mas has just talked about, um, I think. Uh, like I said, the older generation of coaches that I work with have got a significant amount of, of knowledge and information to share. So it's, it's a fine balance for me um, to show them respect and acknowledge what they've achieved, but at the same time, try and challenge them. So one of the strategies coming back to, to what Musa said about the safe environment has been um, 
I've spent the last 18 months working with the next generation of coaches. And my focus has been create a supportive environment where they're willing to share and support and question each other. And, and I've definitely seen a shift with that, what I call next gen group. Um, and then aside with that, what I've been trying to do is, is build their awareness and reflective skills. So making no judgment, encouraging them to communicate with each other. And then in doing so, they can then start to have discussions and observations because in our sport, asking an athlete's opinion on the coach's um, performance or, or what the coach is doing is something that it um, is very threatening for them. So my number one priority to be able to try and shift some of the cultural challenges has been just build a relationship with the next gen group. Thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna send you another poison chalice because okay, one thing is to change the mentality of the culture of the coaches. How do we change the culture around the participant, for example, the parents? And I'll give you an example. I still, I'm, I'm now coaching 13 and 14 year olds. And every now and again, I will get a parent coming to me saying, you're not shouting to my son enough. You need to shout mm -hmm. at him more because he reacts to that. Um, how do we go about changing that culture around the athlete? Well, Serge, um, in Belgium, we have three pillars in our program. And the first is coach education, like Massa also said in Michel, um, and to, to stimulate a permanent education, we have this reflection because I think reflection tool, because reflection is the, is the stimulus for development. But the second, like you said, and also uh, Massa said, you need to have a safe environment. The second pillar is that we are educating also the board members of the clubs um, to, to, to get to know this kind of coaching style and so on. And the third is the parents, like you say. So we have programs for parents um, why we, where we try to explain uh, the impact of coach behavior and, and coach behavior based on self-determination sort of theory. So if they understand, they will not have, I hope they will not have this kind of reaction because it's not enough just to have coach education programs. Uh, it needs to be permanent, therefore reflection, but also you have to create an environment and therefore the programs for uh, board members and for parents. Um, John, I'm going to, as we are getting close to the end, I'm going to hand over back to you to see if you've got any questions um, or any, any final reflection before we bring it to a close. Yeah, no, this has been uh, phenomenal. Thanks so much to each of the panelists. There's uh, been an immense amount of uh, really good content and uh, really thought provoking ideas here. Um, I think Michelle in kind of framing the discussion around what are the kinds of behaviors that really reflect athlete centered coaching I think we've had a lot of really good examples that uh, start towards answering that question. Um, certainly, this is just one step. I think we have to, as Gerd said, the constant dialogue is what really makes the difference. And um, this webinar is a start in that direction. Um, I think athlete-centered coaching really is a fundamental philosophy and value. And we need to keep a dialogue going about the behaviors that are appropriate and inappropriate and how to really manage the emotions and the behaviors to be most effective. So I'd just like to thank everyone for the contribution. Certainly thank all of the attendees that have joined in today um, and look forward to our future webinars. Thank you all. Thanks, John. Um, guys, before we, before we switch off, uh, please, the discussion doesn't have to finish here, okay? You can carry on having a chat with each other on, on Twitter, uh, for example, using the hashtag Athlete Centered Coaching uh, and ICC Connect. Please join the uh, discussion there and, and let's keep talking and we hope to see you in the next one. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.
Thank Thanks you. All. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.